defendant was indicted for possessing and selling controlled substances. The charges were based in part on the seizure of drugs and paraphernalia pursuant to a search warrant covering defendant's premises. In addition to the seized evidence, the people planned to introduce testimony from a witness who had bought cocaine from defendant and returned to the premises when the police executed the warrant. The witness signed a statement to that effect. Shortly after jury selection, the prosecution furnished the defense with a copy of the statement. Within an hour, the witness received a threatening telephone call. The following day, the witness contacted the police and reported that he had been threatened and would not testify. The prosecution brought this uh, uh, to the attention of the court, asserting that defendant was out on bail and behind the threats. The people argued that by threatening the witness, defendant had forfeited his right of confrontation and that the witness's statement should therefore be revealed to the jury. In response, defendant's attorney denied that his client was involved in any witness intimidation. He said he had shared the statement with defendant because he wanted defendant to know of it, but that defendant responded indifferently, dismissing the statement as too recent and unreliable to be of any concern. To test the people's claim, the court began a hearing. The prosecutor called a state police investigator who testified that he spoke with the witness. The witness told the investigator that he received a call from an unknown male, telling him he had better not testify, adding that he knew where the witness and his family lived. The threat served its purpose the witness said he would rather go to jail than testify. With that, the prosecution rested. Defendant then took the stand and acknowledged that his attorney had shown him the statement. He denied, however, conveying or arranging for any threats to the witness. He said he told only one person, my friend Dale over there, about the witness's statement, but did not reveal who the witness was, implying that Dale could not have made the threat because he would not know whom to threaten. Defendant added that the statement was bogus and did not worry him. Both sides told the court they had no other witnesses. The prosecutor then asked to call defendant's attorney to the stand. Counsel did not object, nor did the court suggest that there was anything improper about the people calling defendant's attorney as a witness against defendant. The prosecutor asked defendant's attorney, did you tell anybody other than the defendant about this statement that is, the, that either the identity of the declarant or the substance of the statement was true? Defendant's attorney answered no. With that testimony, the prosecution sought to enhance the circumstantial proof against defendant by showing that only defendant was aware of the statement. His attorney testified he told no one else and therefore was obviously the author of the threats. The prosecutor pointed out that no one other than defendant and his friend knew of the statement and only defendant had something to gain by either delivering or arranging for the threat. The court agreed, placed the blame for the threats at defendant's doorstep and ruled the witness's statement admissible. After a jury found defendant guilty, a divided appellate division affirmed defendant's conviction. 305, Appellate Division 2nd, 993, 2003. A dissenting justice of that court granted leave to appeal. Defendant challenges his conviction on several grounds. He asserts with an issue of great importance and urgency that the facts within the knowledge of defense counsel were relevant to that issue. The prosecution claimed that the defendant had threatened physical violence against a witness and the witness's family, a charge which, if true, called for swift action to protect the integrity of the trial. The prosecutor sought not only the admission into evidence of the witness's written statement, but defendant's immediate incarceration. The Supreme Court was obviously correct in processing and proceeding at once to a hearing to decide the truth or falsity of the charge. This was not a matter that would wait. If after undertaking employment in contemplated or pending litigation, a lawyer learns or it is obvious that the lawyer be called as a witness on a significant issue other than one on behalf of the client, 
The lawyer may continue the representation until it is apparent that the testimony is or may be prejudicial to the client, at which point the lawyer and the firm must withdraw acting as an advocate before the tribunal.